So you can have 40 birthdays, but you can have an immune system that was like a 70 year old. The question is, what the heck is going on with our immune system that's creating all these chronic illnesses that affect six out of 10 of us now, and four out of 10 have more than one. This to me has been such a discovery path for me, and I hope I can share this in a way that makes sense to those that haven't spent the hours that I spent getting into this. Yeah. Diseases don't exist, that they're basically constructs that have been made up by medicine to describe symptoms among groups of people and label them according to those symptoms or lab tests or their exam. You know, you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have depression, you have diabetes, you have uh, asthma, whatever. And, and, and while those terms are helpful, they help us navigate a little bit, they're just the tip of the iceberg. And below that is really where functional medicine goes to understand the root causes and the similarities between all these diseases. And so that's what I learned from you, Jeff, was that with functional medicine, we have a different set of lenses and a different set of perspectives on interpreting the same information. So when I see a patient with a particular condition, I don't just see them in that specialty. I go, well, someone might have arthritis, but it might be coming from the microbiome. Or they might have dementia, but it might be coming from the fact that they tuna fish all their life and have heavy metals. Or the fact they might have a neurological problem, it might be from an absorption issue in their gut, they're not absorbing certain nutrients. So I, I basically am able to see the patterns that connect everything together. And what we really come to learn is that there are a very few basic physiological systems in the body that are all interconnected, that are all influenced by our lifestyle and by our environment and by our genes. And the expression of the interaction of our genes and environment, including an environment meaning what we eat, our sleep, exercise, rest, all that stuff, that determines what happens in these basic systems. And so as a practitioner in functional medicine, what I'm focused on is looking at these different systems and how to analyze them. And there's just a few, there's your immune system, we call it defense and repair, your gut or your microbiome, we call that assimilation, your energy system, which is how your body makes energy, your detox system is how you get rid of waste and environmental toxins, your communication systems, such as hormones and neurotransmitters, your transport system, circulation, lymphatics, and your structural system, everything you're made of. And all that's influenced by our lifestyle and environment and genes. And, it, and that is really what we focus on. And so when we start to look at diseases today, we see this tremendous amount of inflammation across the spectrum of diseases in places we really weren't expecting it. Yes, we know that if you have a eczema, it's a rash, it's inflammation. Yes, we know that if you have allergies or an autoimmune disease, that's inflammation. But it turns out that it seems like everything that we're suffering from today is inflammation. Even things like depression and autism and cancer and diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's, and I could go on and on. And so the question is, what the heck is going on with our immune system that's creating all these chronic illnesses that affect six out of 10 of us now, and four out of 10 have more than one? What went wrong that led to this explosion of inflammatory diseases? Because it seems like, you know, whether you believe we we're created by God or just, you know, basically natural selection or whatever, you know, you believe, somehow our bodies are intelligent. So why are they acting so dumb mm -hmm. <laughs> right now? Mm -hmm. So I, I think you have opened to me what is the focus of the remainder of whatever my professional life is going to be, is that question. And I want to take a little bit of a heretical uh, concept here and maybe be a little bit uh, controversial because I've come to recognize that uh, this construct that inflammation underlies all diseases is actually partly wrong. Mm. Uh, what I would like to say is imbalanced immune systems are behind virtually all of our chronic illnesses that later take away meaningful years of good mm -hmm. living. So, so it's a dysfunctional immune system as opposed to just inflammation. Right, because we have people with allergies that's not inflammation. Allergies is actually an underactive immune system that's imbalanced, that is reacting to its lack of uh, what we call innate system uh, uh, proper control. Ah. So uh, sometimes what we think is inflammation is the body's last mechanism to protect itself against injury because the other stuff that was upstream was not working right. It didn't have the right balance between the two basic systems of the mm. immune, which is the innate, this uh, old ancient system, and then the adaptive, which is the learned system that relates to that's antibodies. That's the antibodies, right. Exactly. So when you get a vaccine, that's, you know, you're creating antibodies very specific against a particular invader, Precisely. whereas the other kind of immunity is more of a generalized immune response that's not specific. That's exactly right. So 
for me, uh, rather than just focus on inflammation in and of itself, which is a downstream effect, I like to go upstream and say, what were the imbalances within that immune system from what we've learned the last 10 or 15 years? Because the immune system of science is, rev is exploding right now. So what are the new things that we've, we've learned through this interrogation? And of course, it's been accelerated uh, by SARS-CoV-2 virus because so much is now in the immune uh, front piece in our, in our mind. It's a little bit, for me, like what happened with HIV. I, I, I was in San Francisco at the Pauling Institute mm -hmm. in the early 80s with mm -hmm. HIV AIDS. And, yeah. and that was a period of time where everybody wanted to study the immune system. And we went through that explosion for 15 years between, say, 82 and 97 of immune system activity. Then it kind of uh, got a little bit more quiescent. We moved over into cancer with immunotherapies and precision cancer therapy. But now we're back to re-exploring the virus connection to the immune system and how it is that some people overreact and some people underreact. Well, we've heard about cytokine storms. What are those about? That's an overreacting immune system because the first part of the immune system was underreacting. Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to reframe our understanding of what I call a, a immunobalance. An immuno balance relates to having a young, vital, responsive immune system that doesn't under respond but doesn't over respond. That's the nature of what we're learning today. Yeah, I mean, so clearly there's a lot of things that cause your immune system to go awry. Yes. And 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 if you just look at the litany of behaviors and exposures that we have in the 21st century, it's no wonder, right? A horribly inflammatory diet is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, probably on the list. <laughs> and, and you were the first one that ever, um, to me, expressed this notion of food as medicine, mm -hmm. and food as information, mm -hmm. as food as instructions, as literally code that programs your biology, and relates directly to your immune system. We're going to get deep into that. But the the thing that fascinates me is that the the immune system. Um, is being assaulted by our inflammatory diet, by environmental toxins, by chronic stress, by lack of sleep, by social isolation, I mean, by disconnection from the natural world. All these things are driving our immune systems to go awry. And they're, they're degrading our immune systems mm -hmm. and they're putting them out of balance. Mm -hmm. And your philosophy and your perspective now is, is how do we fix that? Yeah. And that's the key to successful um, approaches to chronic disease, if we don't understand that, then we're going to keep failing and we're going to keep putting band-aids, you know, or rearranging the deck chairs like Titanic and not really getting to the real causes of these problems. So talk about this idea that happens of immunosenescence, which yeah. is a big word, but essentially means senescence means aging. Mm -hmm. So it's the aging of your immune system. Yeah. Why so, does that happen? And what is the, what is actually happening? Yes. And so, by the way, for all those who are listening, Jeff might say stuff that's a little hard to understand. I'm going to stop him and interrupt him. I'm not being rude. But I'm just trying to like recap so you all get it. Got it. <laughs> so let me, let me go back to first principles real quickly. So let's talk about what is the immune system in a broad kind of general perspective. Because I think everybody uses the term immunity, immune system, but what does that really mean? Mm. So there are really three ways that our body... 24-7, 365, communicates with the outside world. And those are the nervous system, the gut microbiome, and the other microbiomes of, say, the lungs, because we have a microbiome that sits on the mucosal surfaces of our lungs. Every mm. time we breathe, that's mm. getting information. And the third is our immune system. Our immune system is sampling what's going on in the inside and outside world all the time, continuously. Now we would say, well, but the nervous system does that and also the, the microbiome, but the one that most rapidly can change and reconstruct itself is the immune system. Now, why do I say that? Because it's known that of these cells that we call the immune system cells that flow around in our body, that are, they're being made in real time at a very rapid rate. Every 10 seconds, we make a million new white cells, 20 million new platelets, and 30 million new red blood cells. Okay, hold on there. You just said that every every 10 seconds, yes. your bone marrow stem cells yes. produce a million white blood cells. Yes, immune cells. Mm -hmm. And millions of platelets and yep. lots of red blood cells. Yes. <laughs> so so my, now my question, and this, this is what set me a, a few years ago onto this <laughs> journey. I, I asked myself, well, okay, if, if that's happening all the time, silently in our body, are those new cells that are being formed, are they as good as the cells that they're replacing? 
are they worse than the cells that they were replacing, or are they better than the cells they were mm -hmm. replacing? And once you ask that question, good or better, then you have to say, what does good and better mean? And what it means is, is that immune cell that's being formed that will go out in our body so that every two months we're replacing our immune system, that's what it means. Every two months you have a new immune system based upon that turnover. Mm. And that's not when you're ill. It, your immune system is, is even more activated when you're ill and you have an immune reaction. So let's say every two months you have a new immune system. What does it mean that it's as good or worse than it was before? What it means is that the immune cells are carrying either injuries into the next generation, bad memories, things that, that make them, when they make the next generation, less active than the when you were healthy and young. So are these mutations, or they're just... Oh, you're, you're jumping ahead. Hold with me just a second. I'm going to come to that, because there are two ways that that might be. Because like stem cells basically are these cells that produce all the baby cells that are your actual cells. So they're like the... Pluripotential stem cells. The grandmother or grandfather cells. They're sitting in the bone marrow. I think we need to remember the bone marrows. The bones are more than just skeletons. The bones are there that are generating all of our red and white blood cells continuously throughout our life. And they are patterned by our genes as to how they're going to do that, but they're modulated and modified by the environment we've been living in. Mm -hmm. So we all know that if you, uh, let's, let's use exposure to radiation, you know that that can produce uh, cancers like uh, leukemia. Yes. Well, how does that occur? Because it injures, the radiation injures the bone marrow cells so that they undergo injury and then they become a different kind of cell that rapidly proliferates, it forms a leukemia. So what we say is the integrity of these bone marrow cells it, throughout the course of a living 100 years, we want to protect them very carefully so that they don't get injured. And we want to also make their products that they come out of our bone marrow go into our bloodstream and all the cells and the mm. tissues of the body. We want to make them as young as possible. What does everybody say? They say, when I'm young, I could get away with all sorts of things. You know, I could be immortal. It seems like I didn't get sick. But now when I'm getting older, I'm responding to other things and I'm, I'm having allergies and I can't tolerate this and, and I get sick easier and I get the flu and cold. Yes, because that immune system is what you said, becoming senescent, yeah. becoming age, because it's remembering bad experiences you had in your earlier life and it hasn't gotten rid of them. But now we have learned there's a process the body has to reverse that. It's but always going. Before you get into how we fix it, so what are the kinds of things that screw up your stem cells in your bone marrow? Radiation, environmental toxins? Yes. Diet? Yes. Stress? Well, let's, let's talk about Michael Finnick. Michael Finnick, uh, I followed his work. He's a good colleague and friend at uh, CSIRO, the Scientific Research Organization in Australia. He uh, worked in Adelaide, had a big lab there. He's been studying the impact of nutrients on hemopoietic stem cells for 35 years, published hundreds of papers. And he has found that uh, if you get a diet that's a bit uh, imbalanced with regard to certain micronutrients, vitamins and minerals and other factors, that it will increase then the formation of these polynucleated cells. They're funny immune cells, right? And you can actually see them in the microscope with specific staining. He's actually developed a uh, lab test that can do that. And what he actually has found is that Aging of an individual and their inflammatory conditions that they experience later in life are related to the number of these damaged cells that are associated with undernutrition for that individual. So poor, not just poor folic and vitamin B12, but zinc and chromium and magnesium and vitamin yeah, B1, yeah. vitamin B2. All these things play a role in modulating the integrity of those cells. Amazing. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get into like what happens when these stem cells start producing yep. funky offspring Good. Good. <laughs> and, and the implications for our health. But for those listening, I want you to understand that we are going to go deep into this topic and we are going to talk about not only how we can reverse our immune age, but, but specifically what to eat and what to do to fix it. So stay with us for the podcast because I want you to get to the end of this because we got some real <laughs> wonderful take home things that can, can, dri can drive this uh, in, in the right direction. So, Let's go back to uh, this story then. We're, we, we've got all these insults we've created to our bone marrow through the course of living in this modern world with poor diet, environmental toxins, radiation, you name it. Who knows what's affecting glyphosate, this, that. And so then all of a sudden your stem cells start producing these funky little offspring. Uh, what are they called? What happens to them? And what do they do once they get in your bloodstream? Yeah. 
So there's two ways. You already started me down this road, so now I'll come back <laughs> and I'll, I'll rejoin the road. Uh, there are two ways that uh, are processes by which these uh, blood cells can carry forward bad messages. Um, one, you already mentioned the word mutation. That's an actual injury to the nuclear material, the DNA that's in an immune cell that changes the way that it is going to tell its message. So that would be a mutational injury. And, and we carry those mutational injuries in ways that actually, again, can be analyzed in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. It leads to a, a very long-winded word, and I promise you I'm only going to use it once. It's called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. So that's abbreviated CHIP. So these chips... We just call them chip cells. Yeah, these, these chips are debris that form within cells that then have a different personality. And the personality the, where these injuries occurred in the genes of these immune cells happens to be in regulation of areas that are associated with inflammation, uh, particularly uh, uh, a, a gene called TET, 1011 uh, uh, 10, translocase, and another uh, uh, gene that's related to epigenetic modulation of gene expression. That's a lot of, lot of words. Okay, what well, do you do is an epigenetic modulation of gene expression? That means that when your genes are getting read by your body, we can tag those genes in different spots to turn on or off messages that regulate health or disease. So it's a whole new field of understanding how not just our genes can be altered, but these post-gene sort of products can be modified and, and actually cause them to be damaged in a way that leads to really bad outcomes for our health. Absolutely. Or, or good outcomes, right? Yeah. And that they're passed on in ways that we didn't even really understand. That, that if your grandmother was exposed to a toxin, that that toxin can injure the cells in a way that creates an epigenetic mark on those genes and then leads to changes in the grandchildren <laughs> that have profound impact on their health. That's right. So now you, you, you like turned on my whole limbic system because th this to me has been such a discovery path for me and I hope I can share this in a way that makes sense to those that haven't spent the hours that I've spent getting into this. Yeah. So I read a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine several years ago by uh, one of the principal investigators at Harvard uh, Mass General uh, Medical School and Hospital. Um, uh, Siddhartha uh, Giaswal is his name. And this was a paper of his uh, group's report that they had been looking at uh, patients that have uh, bloodborne cancers like leukemias uh, that then suffer from a precursor to that disease called myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, what does that mean, MDS? Um, it's a syndrome where the blood cells actually start to change their shape because they've undergone injury, these mutational injuries. And it was thought that myelodysplastic syndrome was only a precursor of blood cancers. But his work then found that when they started to study this in more detail, way before this person would ever get a blood cancer, that those injuries were also associated with incidence of cardiovascular disease. And when I read this paper, I thought, oh my word, this is an epic new discovery. Because what this says is that it's a, uh, a route to many different chronic diseases, not just to cancer. So these it's, chip cells that you're talking about, that's right. we thought were just maybe causing cancer, but you said that they're now maybe causing heart disease and all kinds of other diseases. And since, and so I asked Dr. G as well to come and speak uh, to our group, the uh, Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute group. And I knew it was gonna be a very high level, you know, research presentation and a lot of the docs in our group might not get it. but. What has happened now is I've followed Dr. Gia's wall and many others that are now getting into this field to recognize that exactly what I had predicted would occur, or I forecast might occur, mm -hmm. that the more they looked at this, the more that they would find these chips were associated with many other diseases, diabetes, hormonal uh, problems in postmenopausal women, which has just been reported, dementia. So now- Autoimmune disease. Yes, auto, thank you, autoimmune Diabetes. disease. And so now we're saying, well, hold it just a minute. This is a fundamental process that precedes way early where a person's going to end up 10 years later when they start getting these increased um, injuries to their immune system. By the way, this process falls under the term training the immune system. You can train the immune system to be better or it can be trained the, uh, the immune system to be worse. Right? Okay, so, so let's just take it back a little. So the bone marrow stem cells get injured. Yes. Produces these chip cells, yes. otherwise known as zombie cells. Well, zombie cells are a little different. They're closely related. They're also mutational, but that, that's, a, that's a slightly different story. Okay. But they, they relate to one another. So they're connected. And then they go into the bloodstream. Yes. A million every 10 seconds. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they start creating this havoc 
of a dysregulated immune system that's linked to all these chronic illnesses. That's right. So what is so that's like the bad news story. And How by the way, body? you you use the term. Here's where we reintroduce the term immunosenescence, aging the immune system. There's a direct link between the number of these chip cells and the age of your immune system. So you could have 40 birthdays, but you could have an immune system that was like a 70 year old. Or you could have be a 70 year old and have an immune system like a 40 year old, depending on how much of these collected injuries your, your immune system is carrying forward. Mm. And lastly, just so I can come back to the epigenetics, because that's the second mechanism, is if you're changing then on your uh, messaging of your genes in your immune system, the epigenome, this thing that regulates how the immune system is going to function, you've got two ways then, one mutational injury and the other epigenetic modulation, both of which combine to give rise to the biological age of your immune system. So now we can actually measure your biological age through telomeres, but also through looking at your immune age, which is kind of new. This is a DNA methylation test, right? Yes, and, the, and the, now it's finding uh, the uh, extraordinary work that uh, Blackburn did in the discovery of the telomeres and with Eliza Ethel and won the Nobel Prize. Uh, it's a very, very important uh, part of our understanding of the aging process. But in terms of the immune system, telomere shortening is probably not as important as is this epigenetic and chip formation that I'm describing. That then really is more sensitive to how your immune system is aging than is telomere shortening. And now we're able to measure that with a finger stick. Blood test, yes. right? Yes, yes. So you can do it at home. Yeah, so now people are starting to actually examine, uh, I call this a surrogate marker. What does that mean? It means that it's not directly looking at the age like your birthday comes up every year. It's looking at a marker that tells you about the function of your immune system that's associated with your age. Uh, Stephen Horvath at UCLA has been studying what he calls the, the clock mechanism for assessing yeah. your biological age. And this is based on these patterns of epigenetic regulation. So um, people want to get a test for this. How would they get it? Well, there's a number of labs. Uh, True Age does a home testing. Uh, DNAge, D-N-A-G-E, has a home testing uh, uh, thing that you can mail in with a finger stick of blood. Yeah. And I recommend in, in terms of this measuring that it, it'd be better to do it with a finger stick of blood than do it with saliva. Saliva is you're measuring the age of your buccal cells and, and which are not directly related to your immune cell. Your, your blood is you're measuring 10% of, of a blood drop is your white blood cells. Mm. So you're more measuring your immune cells. So this sounds kind of depressing. So our bone marrow gets injured, it creates all this damage to cells, produces all this havoc in our immune system, creates all these chronic diseases. Sounds like a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and it good, is for a lot of people. And there's a good news story in here, which we now understand actually how to reverse this process. Yeah. It's called immuno rejuvenation. Yes. And that's what Big Bold Health is all about, is the science of immuno rejuvenation. Yes. And discovering ways using food as medicine yes. to reverse your biological age of your immune system and actually create immuno rejuvenation instead of immunosenescence. That's what we're going to get to at the end of this conversation. Here, here. But I have a few more steps I want to understand. Uh, is, so, so these chip cells get in the bloodstream. Um, what is the mechanism by which they cause all these problems? What are they doing? Yeah, so these um, injuries, these mutations, as, as we talked about, uh, turn on and alter specific uh, genes to function within the immune cells. And the genes that are principally seemingly altered are those that control a process called inflammation. And I know you've spoken at length about inflammation. And this is the, one of the mechanisms of inflammation. It's a chronic inflammatory state. It's like a simmering pot that is always boiling of rubor, color, and dolor. So, so the chip cells are communicating with your DNA? Well, the DNA on. in the chip cells. The DNA in the chip, in the cells, chip cells is driving inflammation. Is driving this inflammation. Because what it does is then it, it regulates the way that our immune cells see themselves. They think now that they're in a hostile environment. And when they're in a hostile environment, they do exactly what our body's supposed to do in a hostile environment, fight back. Yeah. And fighting back is inflammation. And, and that's, to me, why I say don't label inflammation bad. Inflammation is agnostic. It's not bad or good. It's all related to balance. Yeah. But if you're in a constant state of inflammation, because you've got this chronic inflammation going on, now you've got collateral damage. Yeah. And, and you're that, paying a price. And that inflammation is across all spectrum disease. So yeah, that's, right. that, that's sort of the bad news. And it seems like the, 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 the people don't understand exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> what happens, you, your DNA basically codes for proteins. That's it, all it does. 
it's got a four letter code, ACTG, and any three letter group is a, is a protein. It's a gene, a gene that codes for, for proteins. And, and those proteins do stuff in the body and, and the, most of your immune function happens through these proteins. Yeah, antibodies are proteins. Yeah, and so, so basically you're screwing, up your, you're screwing up your messages produced by your genes that are turning on all these inflammatory downstream products that get that, produced that in the body. That is correct. Okay. And it, it can be different from, from cell type to cell type. So you're, you, you might have inflammation principally in the liver or you might have it principally in the muscles, or you might have it principally in the brain, in the astrocytes. So there are, you know, there's a regional specificity to inflammation based upon where the immune system is injured. Okay, so this is a great story. So basically, we're down this, this rabbit hole of our nasty lifestyle, environmental chemicals, our bad diet, causing the aging of our immune system through these chip cells that creates inflammation throughout the body and creates all these secondary diseases that we're treating with all kinds of drugs and procedures that really are missing the boat. What, what you're saying is there's also a science, not of just immunosenescence, but of immunorejuvenation, a yes. way in which we can work with our biology to help get rid of these chip cells and clean up our blood and end up rejuvenating our immune system so that it works better and we don't end up with all these chronic age-related diseases that are driven by inflammation. That is absolutely correct. So, so Tell us about the body's own innate mechanisms for dealing with this, because it seems like it's not working very well, and that there are other things we can do to really rejuvenate our immune system, which we're gonna to get to in a minute, but w the body must have some way of handling this kind of injury. It's just, why is it working? <laughs> why is okay, so, so let, let's start the good news here. The good news is in every person, every person, the body is renewing its immune system all the time. And that's really good news. The problem is, particularly for the reasons you've already described, that for many people, the rate at which the immune system is picking up bad memories exceeds the rate at which it is renewing itself. Yeah. So it's not like you have no renewing. It's just that it can't keep up the pace with the things that are being damaged. Yeah. And so as we learned from Dr. Sidney Baker so many years ago in functional medicine, there's two things that you do. You take the thing away that's causing the problem, you add the thing that's missing, mm. right? That's the basic concept of functional medicine. So what you need to take away are all the factors that are enhancing and increasing the mutational injury and the epigenetic modifica modification of the immune system while you're giving the things that lead to immune cell house cleaning. And that process of immune cell house cleaning won a Nobel Prize in 2013 for its discovery. It has another term that we have put now into our lexicon, called autophagy. Mm. Autophagy is self-eating of debris. The body has that process. It has these magical ways that it can restore itself. Then, and if autophagy is present at the proper rate and balance, and it's not exceeded by the rate of injury, mm. now what are you doing? You're immunorejuvenating. Yeah, and this is what people are talking about when they talk about time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, right. ketogenic diets, fast-mimicking diets. They're all working on this process of activating the body's own garbage disposal system. Precisely. <laughs> and the cleanup projects that have to happen. And when you're eating all the time, your body doesn't have a chance to rest and renew and repair or immunorejuvenate. So can we stop right here yeah. for a second? I want to take, you and I are fast paced thinkers and talkers, but I want to take just a deep cerebral breath here for a moment. Because what you just said, I'm taking a breath as I'm saying it, <laughs> What you just said is a paradigm shift of major magnitude mm. in the way we've been thinking in the field of science and body's function for the last 200 years. This is a threshold mm -hmm. we're just crossing that is so dramatically important for mm. us to learn because it puts us back in control. Mm. We're not just a victim. We now have some uh, gears that we or some knobs and, and switches that we can manipulate if we understand who we are individually and what we need to do to exactly what you just said. Before it was like, I'm just the luck of the draw, poor me, I got a damaged immune system, there's nothing I can do about it. Now we're saying, no, there are processes that we can hold on to and manipulate for rejuvenation. That's powerful. That is powerful. Okay, so let's go down the list practically of what are those things that cause immunosenescence that we need to get rid of, according to Cindy Baker, yeah. and what are those things that we need to add into our life or diet or whatever that will help us rejuvenate our immune system. Good. So okay. what, what is the first? 
Well, I think you've done a very good job of, of putting together the laundry list of the things that we know. Just to recap. Okay, so let's start with radiation. So particularly ionizing radiation. Uh, and that includes even UV exposure, because we know that the skin undergoes cellular damage and we get these uh, actinic keratoses. That's an example of- So I'm kind of scrubbing why most of the winter. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how you protect yourself. So that's one. Number two, uh, as we already mentioned, has to do with toxins. So toxins could, could be of a variety of type. They could be persistent organic pollutants, uh, POPs, from the chemical industry, or they could Pesticides, be- Pesticides, chemicals, yes. plastics, BPA, all Ex that junk. Exactly. They could also be internal toxins produced by endotoxemia from our own microbiome, because if we have funny bugs growing in our body's gut, that can induce then the production of secondary substances that are toxic that our body has to manage. Mm. So it could be a gut endotoxic problem. So basically your, your gut microbiome, when there's bad bugs in there, produce nasty chemicals and yes. molecules that leak into your bloodstream and create inflammation throughout your whole body. Yes. So if, you're, if your gut's not happy, your immune system's not happy. That's because 60% of your immune system is in your gut. That's exactly right. And so the, th the third area, which... Um, Maybe a little bit more confusing for the average person, but I'll, let me try to make it hopefully understandable, is a form of body fat accumulation that's called central body fat, or body fat that's around the midsection. Belly fat. That's around, yeah, it's around the organs, right? It's, it's not subcutaneous organ fat. fat. It's, it would be organ fat. Organ fat turns out to be a very big contributor to this process of inflammation and injury to the immune system. And in fact, there is a paper, a study just done at Harvard that's, uh, I think, really fascinating. It was done in postmenopausal women looking at their uh, risk to later stage cardiovascular disease, to heart disease. And it found that there was a correlation between chips in their immune system and their postmenopausal heart disease risk if and only if they had a lot of central body fat, mm -hmm. meaning all the immune cells that are clustered because our fat is an endocrine organ that has a lot of immune cells in it, our, our central fat. And how do we get belly fat, by the way? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> eating, eating starch and sugar. Precisely. Which is what I've been talking about, and you taught me decades ago. It's all about insulin resistance, which we've talked about a lot on this podcast, and this idea that when you eat this diet of starch and sugar, this is our diet in America, it's about 60% of our calories, that it drives this belly fat growth. And that is like a fire in the belly, literally, Absolutely. fire in the belly. It's driving all this inflammation, and that inflammation in turn will cause damage in the bone marrow too. Absolutely, it's a, it's a so crosstalk. It's not, it's not just, it's, it's yeah. a cyclical crosstalk. Because if you look microscopically at that, that organ fat under the microscope, what you're gonna see in there are a bunch of immune cells that are right inside the fat cells, the adipocyte cells. And those immune cells are having conversation with the fat cells. And if the fat cells are unhappy and they're saying, I'm fed up, I'm fed up with what you're doing to me, they tell the immune system that they're fed up. And the immune system then goes out into the bloodstream and it tells the rest of the body it's fed up. The immune cells in the gut are now telling the brain it's fed up. Oh, wow. So this, this interconnection that you talked about, this web, is what we're learning about. And what about stress and exercise? Well, you're jumping ahead. I, you got just a second, I'm gonna get to that. Because next you talked about time-restricted feeding or about uh, fa intermittent fasting or something like that. So what does that do? And you already said it beautifully, that what, what happens to us as humans because of the availability we have of food and celebration around food and, and often foods that are not so good for us uh, with a lot of uh, immune uh, activating substances like sugar, uh, that we then find ourselves overdoing a good thing. <laughs> uh, and as we overdo a good thing, our body, as you said it earlier, doesn't have a rest. The immune system doesn't have a rest. The immune system likes to have a rest, just like the brain likes to have a rest when we sleep. When we're sleeping and our brain is renewing, our immune system is so, renewing. So, so the answer is one of the things that causes damage to your immune system is eating all the time. Yes. Is eating before bed, is not giving yourself a break for 12 and hours. And lack of rest. Yeah. Rest is a very powerful therapeutic tool that allows re rejuvenation. Right, if you're constantly stimulating the friend in with things that could injure the immune system, you don't have the, the activity in the back end to reju it, uh, rejuvenate it effectively. So this sleep cycle is connected to the way and the frequency we eat and what we eat. It is again a lifestyle pattern that all works together, not just like I'm gonna do one thing. Yeah. 
Okay, so that's now let's go to the big one, which is the one that I think has had the biggest controversy, but it's also the biggest area for discovery. And that is how does the experience in life speak through our immune system to our function of our immune system? And you know, we used to think that kind of the immune system was over here and our brain was over here. And so our bad life experiences, they would be over here, but our immune system was kind of insulated because of the brain, blood brain barrier. No, no, it's not true at all. What we now recognize very clearly is the experiences that we have in life, the, the, the harmful post-traumatic stress syndromes, let's say, lock into our immune system. These specific mutational injuries, these epigenetic changes, in such a way as they can dysregulate our immune system. So we can, months or years later, still be carrying that bad memory in our immune system that shifts us over into this inflammatory yeah. state. So never should we think that the experiences in living, the relationships we have, the love and appreciation and sense of fulfillment is not a direct important component of our immune so system. So our relationships function. can be inflammatory, our thoughts That's can right. be inflammatory. You know, there's a whole term we used to use called psychoneuroimmunology. Yes. But we keep having to change it now. Psycho neuro, endo, microbiome, <laughs> exactly. toxic low <laughs> immunology. Yes. Right? And it's like, and everything is, it's like, all, you know, it's all connected. Like, you know, and I, I think of, of the word joy, right? Like I'm having joy right now. I'm mm -hmm. having an emotional joy during this conversation. <laughs> and, and it just lights me up. So what is it doing to my immune system? If I could go in with my microscopic eyes and, and you know, and travel through my immune system, I'd have lit up excited immune cells yeah. that were celebrating. I wouldn't have depressed, anxious, uh, injurious immune cells. Yeah. So I, I think that this construct that we're describing is a model for living of which the immune system, because it's constantly sampling yeah. our environment mm -hmm. and feeding back to us what it sees, is a good entry point for health. It's not an abstraction. I mean, your thoughts and your feelings, your emotions, your relationships, all literally speak to your immune system in real time, regulate their function. Yes. For good or bad. And I, I think most of us don't understand that. I mean, even the field of sociogenomics is so fascinating to me. You can be sitting in a room with someone and having a deep, heartfelt connection, and you will turn off all the inflammatory genes in the body. <laughs> if you're having an argument with somebody or you're not connecting with them, it's the opposite. That's right. So it's not just some vague theory. It's actually well-documented science. And that's, that is part of the word that you used earlier, of immune rejuvenation. Mm. If every day you had the greatest part of your day in that state that you've just described, I guarantee you, you'd be rejuvenating your immune system. It okay. would be, because you'd have less injured cells, immunosenescent cells, and you'd have more immunorejuvenating cells. Amazing. Okay, so basically, to, take, to summarize, we have to get rid of toxins in our life as best as possible. I always go to the Environmental Working Group or EWG.org to learn how to avoid most of these toxins. We can't avoid all of them, obviously. We need to make sure we're not eating a diet that's inflammatory that causes visceral fat, which is starch and sugar and processed food and eating a whole foods diet. We need to make sure we are very conscious of our thoughts and relationships and connections and emotions because they have a big impact on us and practice techniques that can help with that, like meditation or yoga or various kinds of practices. Uh, exercise also is important. Sleep is important. Not eating all the time is important. <laughs> Having a break for 12, 14, 16 hours a day. These are really simple, practical things that anybody can do to rejuvenate your immune system. Yes. So that's the good, st that's the good stuff. Uh, but there's another layer to this, right? Which yep. is what are the things we could do proactively in addition to these, avoiding the things that yep. cause immunosenescence to actually cause immunorejuvenation? Here, here. And this is, this is where the, the conversation is going to get really interesting because... What we've discovered is that there are compounds in food that we thought were, we call them secondary compounds, or I mean, this almost sounds like your second cousin, like it's not really that important. Mm -hmm. And these compounds in food are not protein, fat, carbohydrate, fiber, vitamins, minerals, or something else, which it turns out we've evolved with for millennia that are critical if we want to be healthy. You don't necessarily get a deficiency disease like scurvy or rickets if you don't have it, but you get chronic disease later on in life. Yeah. And so what's really exciting is this world of phytochemicals, which is a weird word, or phytonutrients. Phyto, not the dog, but phyto, P-H-Y-T-O, <laughs> which means plant. So plant compounds that are in plants that somehow affect our biology in real time. And this is what 
I think, you know, we mean when we say food is medicine or food is information. I mean, the macronutrients are information, the micronutrients are information, but the phytonutrients are also information. And it turns out they've been a completely ignored area of medicine that may turn out to be the most important discovery of our time of how to use food to heal chronic disease. Hear, hear. And I see this all the time in my practice. And it's a miracle. Like I think, I mean, if, it, literally if I saw this in medical school, I would have like win the Nobel Prize because you don't, you don't see this. But it's now we see it all the time for people who are doing functional medicine with real transformations. And I've told these stories over and over. I've had guests on the show. We talked about the, the it's just, it's just tremendous. So what you, what you helped us understand over 30 years is this field of food as medicine. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting more and more granular about it. And, and one of the exciting areas is how to use food as medicine to rejuvenate your immune system. And that's what I want to get into. So we're going to talk about a, co a, a bunch of compounds, and there's a lot of them. There's 25,000 or so of these compounds. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation is spending hundreds of millions of dollars creating the periodic table of phytochemicals. Uh, we're learning about how they regulate everything in our biology from detoxification to our microbiome, to our immune system, to our mitochondria, to hormones. I mean, pretty much everything, right? Mm -hmm. And, and we don't really even learn about them in medical school. We don't talk about them. And they are probably among the most important things we can do to regulate our biology. And we've heard about superfoods. Well, what makes them super? It's these phytochemicals, right? Blueberries, right? Mm -hmm. We've talked about that. We know about you know, catechins in green tea or paranthocyanidins in berries or glucosinolates in broccoli. Maybe you don't know what that is. But anyway, it's, they're all good stuff that's in the food. Yeah. And it turns out that with this immune story, there are a bunch of compounds in food, some of them recently discovered, that have powerful effects to turn the clock back of aging of your immune system. And, and they, these compounds uh, you've come across through, through your research. So I want you to tell us a story of this product, this compound, com well, not a compound, but this food called Himalayan tartary buckwheat. And, I, and, I, and there may be other foods that help us rejuvenate our immune system, but I want to go down the, the, the trail of this buckwheat because it's kind of illustrates the, the science behind what we're talking about. Yeah, I think this so, is so before, so you, before you start on your so uh, powerful. Before you start on, I want I want you to tell the story because you 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 know you know what do they say? Uh, chance uh, favors favors prepared, prepared, prepared mind, right? Yeah. So <laughs> our genius is you know ninety nine percent perspiration, one percent inspiration, and you. Have been reading the science and you're reading all these weird papers that no one else bothers to read and you know end up you know with three readers <laughs> but you read this stuff and you came across something in one of these papers that sort of caught your attention about a molecule that you never heard about tell yeah. us about that day and the discovery and yeah th this was uh, this was one of those like ahas and one of the reasons i really like the primary literature because often you'll pick up little tidbits and you'll say wow that's interesting i never thought about that so this was an article in the journal of clinical investigation uh, in 2017 uh, from uh, Vanderbilt University. And um, it was uh, describing a new way of managing blood pressure by using the immune system because the immune cells speak to the walls of the blood vessels and they can cause them to relax and uh, lower blood pressure. And this compound that they were studying uh, had a name, a scientific name, called 2-hydroxyl benzylamine. Yeah, or to be everybody has in their kitchen cabinet, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> 2-hydroxyl benzylamine. <laughs> the, the abbreviation is 2-HOBA, H-O-B-A. So 2-HOBA. And, um, and, and I was reading the paper, and I thought, well, that's really interesting how the immune system could be connected to blood pressure in ways that I hadn't thought about. So then I went to the experimental part of the paper and was reading the fine print, and there was a little paragraph saying that there's only one place in nature that this 2-HOBA uh, can be found. It's in this Himalayan tartary buckwheat. And I thought, well, hold on. I don't know anything about it. What's this Himalayan tartary buckwheat? I consider myself pretty knowledgeable about food. Yeah, I never heard I, of it. But I never heard about this. So I think that you hit on an incredibly important part of this story because at first I thought, well, this Himalayan tartary buckwheat, this two hopa story is kind of interesting. But then as I started to do more research into what was known about Himalayan tartary buckwheat, I found out that this 60 to 100 times more phytochemicals had to do with over a hundred different phytochemicals, not just two hoba. It was one of the most immune active, nutrient rich plant foods ever discovered in the world. So it's like, like the most amazing new superfood we've ever found. That, that's right. And then to make it historically interesting, I, I traced the history and I found out that that particular food had come from Asia across to Northern Europe and then had gotten on the boats to come to colonial America. 
Mm. And it was one of the first foods that was used in colonial America because it doesn't require pesticides, herbicides, irrigation. It, uh, it fights off weeds. It's very, very good and different climactic. And it likes toxic soils that are rich in aluminum because it has an aluminum detoxifying gene. And I thought, oh my word, why didn't this product stick around if it was already in yeah. the American food supply system? And I came to the conclusion, I don't know this is absolutely for sure, but I think it's because new cultivars of higher yielding wheat and other grains, because Himalayan tartar buckwheat is not a grain, it's a seed. And these new grains from the cereal family, which are genetically entirely different than Himalayan tartary buckwheat, and that's why Himalayan tartary buckwheat has no gluten, whereas grains have, have gluten, yeah. those products had higher yields, they were much more mild tasting, they could be built into different uh, baking products yeah. more easily, and people like the ability to put uh, different flavors and not have that flavoring of the tartary buckwheat yeah. because of all those chemicals. Interesting, chemicals. interesting. Okay, so let's talk about these phytochemicals yeah. because here's a plant that was grown in some of the harshest conditions in the world in the Himalayas yeah. for soils, cold weather, no water, you know, just like- Solar, a lot of sun, high altitude. High altitude, Maybe. lots of sun. Yeah. I mean, and what happens to plants when they're stressed like that? Yeah. What happens to them? Well, that's very important. If you take a plant that's not used, its genes are not used to those hostile conditions and you try to plant them there, they won't survive, right? Yeah. But if over the largest experiment of plant development in history, which is called natural selection, which yeah. is millions of years, that plant has become capable of being prosperous in that hostile environment, it now has the genes that can regulate its response to stress. A plant has immune systems. This was an aha for me. Because so the phytochemicals, I, in a sense, are the plant's own defense mechanisms. That's exactly right. And they are the active principles of the immune system in the plant. The plant doesn't have the same kind of immune system we have with circulating white blood cells. It has a different set of immune active components, much of which related to their phytochemicals that are serving as the immune system in the plant. So a hardy immune system in a plant that is resistant to stressful and, and hostile conditions when eaten, transfers those principles to the human. Which is amazing. So basically, we're, we're borrowing the defense mechanisms of plants to help regulate our biology. That's right. And this is true not just for Himalayan pottery buckwheat, but for all yes. foods that we eat that are real whole foods that have different molecules in them that are not the traditional protein, fat, carbs, and all that. And what, what's fascinating to me is that the tougher the life of the plant, the more powerful these phytochemicals yeah. are. That's and that's why this Himalayan buckwheat that's in the, like grown in the most difficult conditions on the planet is among the most powerful superfoods. And it explains, for example, why when you eat a wild food, like a wild strawberry, it might be like the size of a peanut, is actually way more tasty mm -hmm. than a strawberry you buy conventionally grown. This is a big, big red strawberry. Yes. Because of these phytochemicals, yes. the phytochemical richness of the food. And it turns out that these phytochemicals are ubiquitous in plants that, that are, are, are so important for our development and our growth and our healing and our repair systems, but we basically bred them out of our food supply. Right. So the phytochemicals in the modern food supply are so much less than they used to be. We see more wild foods. We used to eat foods grown in more difficult conditions. We used to eat foods that weren't all hybridized for starch and, starch and yield and, and you know, drought and all this that, that actually removes those. And what we've removed also is flavor. I mean, you know a, a tomato that you get an heirloom tomato that you grow in your vine, you pick at the end of summer, it's like this explosion of flavor in your mouth. I mean, Karen Washington was on the podcast, talked about the first time you had a tomato like that, it blew her mind and led to a whole life of gardening and urban renewal and, and uh, you know urban community gardens. And those phytochemicals are, are the things that actually help us stay healthy. And they, they somehow figured out our bodies are lazy, basically, and so we only make the things that we gotta make. We don't make vitamin C, we don't make a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We get them from our food. But we've evolved, I call it symbiotic phytoadaptation. We've evolved symbiotically with the plants, so we borrow their defense mechanisms. And it turns out we really need these if we wanna really have robust health. We, we need these to create optimal health. That's right. And, and so our whole food supply is basically denuded of these phytochemicals. 
uh, it's terrifying. <laughs> and it turns out they're way more important than we thought in terms of our health, and, and particularly in terms of our immune health. And these sec we call them secondary compounds. They're what the plants use to help regulate their health and biology, and we borrow them for ours. And it's just an incredible story of, of our intricate and intimate relationship with nature. Absolutely. What was even more fascinating is that the, the food that we're eating today is so lacking in these compounds. It's also flavorless, mm -hmm. like a flavorless cardboard mm -hmm. tomato. Even, even your vegetables that we're eating are not necessarily as nutritious as they were 50 years ago. And they, and, and, and they are, um, unfortunately, the majority of our diet today. And that's why we're seeing all this chronic disease. So I have a theory that it's the lack of phytochemicals over a long period of time that's really driving a lot of the chronic disease. So I interviewed in, in uh, one of my uh, audio magazines years ago uh, a professor at a university in Britain, and he had just written a series of papers in the um, uh, British Journal of Medicine um, talking about what happened to the health of the British people when they moved away from the agrarian living into urbanized uh, city living and this, this would be uh, the Victorian period. And he said, you know, it was thought that the uh, people before who were living on farms had the really poor health habits and they were not, not uh, achieving good nutrition. But when he went back and looked at the health records, because it turns out in England that they have detailed handwritten health records on individuals going back several hundred years. They were really good at keeping these records. Mm. And when he studied these records, he found out that actually it was a misnomer that people that we're eating these traditional diets of these kind of poor people's diets, the, the thick brown bread and the vegetables from the garden, they were actually very, very healthy. And they actually, if they didn't die of an injury or infection, uh, they actually had a very much longer life expectancy than people who lived in the more modern Victorian era yeah. that were starting to eat the more processed foods. Yeah. And he attributed this all to what you just said because he did quantitative studies showing the reduction in phytochemicals that mm. had occurred when they moved into this more urbanized mm -hmm. eating environment, 80% loss of phytochemicals based on his calculations. Yeah. So I, I think that your point is very well taken because let's, let's use the word vitamin. Everybody knows the word vitamin. What is vitamin derived from? Vite, life, amine, some compound that has an amine structure that pr promotes life. So we have vitamin B1, 2, 3, 6, and mm -hmm. so forth. And what we recognize is that those are essential for life because if you don't get them, you die of a deficiency disease. Scurvy, mm -hmm. beriberi, pellagra, xerothalmia, rickets. But there's no deficiency disease that you can identify for the lack of these phytochemicals. They just then set the tone for age-related disorders like senescence, which are much harder to study if they come on 20 years later than something in two months you have scurvy. So this is the problem we've had. We don't have a good biomarker right. for people getting nutrient deficiencies of phytochemicals where we have a good biomarker for vitamin C deficiency. Yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, the whole idea of food is pharmacology, eat your medicine. The name of this podcast is Doctor's Pharmacy with an F. I think the whole idea is that these are, are medicinal compounds and flavor is what they produce. So when you eat really flavorful foods and plants, they're rich in phytochemicals. And, and that is just a fascinating observation. So flavor and the medicine of the food are totally connected. Okay, so let's stop just for a moment. This is a way station. What is flavor connected to? Taste. What is taste connected to? Taste is connected to a neurosensory mechanism through a variety of different specialized cells that respond to specific tastings. Sweet, bitter, salty, umami. We know about the yeah. sour. These are unique feature sets within our neurological system that then regulate to our brain some sensation saying pleasant or unpleasant. Now, let me take this a step farther. What we now recognize is that many of these phytochemicals, which have a sensory uh, flavor of bitter, that those bitter sensa uh, sensors are not just on the tip of the tongue. They are distributed throughout our whole body. Oh, wow. We have taste receptors in our gut. Our gut is tasting and what happens if the gut tastes a specific bitter phytochemical? It turns on an activity to release into the bloodstream hormones, this is called the introendocrine system, that regulate blood sugar and inflammation. Wow. So we have drugs now to treat diabetes, don't we? And those drugs that treat diabetes are called endocrine active 
hor um, hormonal uh, drugs yeah. and incretin drugs. Yeah. Yeah. What those drugs do is mimic bitter taste Interesting. mechanisms. Well, you know, it's so funny, Jeff, because in Chinese medicine, bitter melon, That's which right. is a mel it's like a melon that's really bitter, <laughs> is really good for diabetes. And it's been studied that those phytochemicals activate a specific cell type, uh, actually in the uh, intraendocrine system of our gut, to release what's called um, GLP-1, uh, glucagon-like peptide-1. Glucagon-like peptide-1 is a hormone that is now being used to activate and treat diabetes. Amazing. Do you want to know my secret for living a long and happy and healthy life? Well, all I have to do is check out my weekly newsletter, Mark's Picks, where I share my favorite tips for health, longevity, well-being, and lots more. Check it out and the link below. Okay, so this is an incredible story, and, and this Himalayan tartary buckwheat is full of over 130 of these phytochemicals, some of which are found nowhere else in nature, that have powerful properties to regulate our biology and rejuvenate our immune system. So talk about how and again, there are many other compounds that, that can be beneficial for health. Sure. There's 25,000, as I mentioned. And in my whole my book, The Peak and Dot, I talked about the role of these compounds and how powerful they are. But the Himalayan tartary buckwheat, how does it work on these chip cells? How does it work to rejuvenate yeah. your immune system? So that has been a really interesting story that's emerging. Because generally what scientists will do, and you know this very well, is they'll, they'll look at those 100 different phytochemicals and they'll say, which ones are doing the heavy lifting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'll go and they'll find... The reductionism. A, exactly. They'll find a molecule. And then they'll study the heck out of that molecule. Well, that's been done with Himalayan tartary buckwheat. We could go on the list. Rutin, uh, quercetin, diosmin, luteolin, physetin, hesperidin. These are some of the major of the 100 or so phytochemicals in Himalayan tartary buckwheat, along with 2-HOPA. And each one of those has been individually studied and has been found individually to have effects on uh, yeah. immune rejuvenation yeah. by activating this process of autophagy selective to the immune system. And in fact, now we have see all sorts of papers being published on quercetin. It's, it's the darling right yeah. now. And quercetin is an important member of this family, so I don't want to undersell it. But quercetin doesn't work the same when it's working by itself as when it works with 99 other phytochemicals yeah, that are team. all it's in the It's a team, it's a team effort. That's right. And so here as we get into fractionalized foods, saying, oh, let's just pull one, yeah. one nutrient out and then we'll make that the nutrient of the month, versus saying, no, it's the combination that makes the orchestration of effects right. that's causing immune rejuvenation. Yeah, so Michael Pong called nutritionism is the reductionist approach to studying nutrition. That's why we have saturated fat and salt and this and that, instead of looking at the whole composition of the yes. diet. So important. So, so basically what you're saying is, is these compounds in the Himalayan tartary buckwheat help to get rid of all these old cells and rejuvenate our immune system through yes, this and, process and, of and let, let me say one thing uh, to loop back to a point you made earlier, and you, and you did so eloquently, by the way, when you were talking about the fundamental processes that people start having problems with as they get older and get more ill. One of those you mentioned was mitochondrial function which is the energy powerhouse of the cell where our energy is produced. Well, it turns out that our mitochondria can, uh, within immune cells can undergo injury. And when they do so, that produces a senescent immune cell. So the mitochondria itself can be the seat of the initial injury that then creates the damage to the immune cell to yeah. make it senescent. Now, what do you do to get rid of bad mitochondria? Because the mitochondria can rejuvenate themselves in the absence of the cell rejuvenating. The mitochondria has a life of its yeah. own within the cell. Yeah. And that process is called mitophagy. It's a subset of the big process called autophagy. Right. And it turns out that these chemicals, that are these phytochemicals that are in tartary buckwheat, specifically have been found to have mitophagy influences on immune Maybe. cells. Wow. So it re-energizes the cell. Yeah, you're, you're kind of cleaning up your energy system. That's right. It's like cleaning your carburetor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and the spark plugs or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. This is an incredible story. So you've written a lot about immune rejuvenation, and you, you talk about a stepwise process to help rejuvenate your immune system. Can you kind of break down a little bit these four steps of immune rejuvenation program that you've developed? Yeah. And by the way, all this is on BigBoldHealth.com. You can read about it. You can listen to podcasts, read the articles, read the science. It's just fascinating. Yeah, I, I think what's happened, you can hear it probably in my tone of voice, is this has just sucked me in full on. It's like, it's like I opened the door and it was a vacuum and it just sucked me right like in. a wormhole. Because there is so much here that I think will help people once we learn how to really apply this in a personalized way. This is really personalized immunity. And... Um, 
We now recognize that people have different immune identities. Just like they have different fingerprints, they have different immune identities. That requires different approaches towards their immune identities to uh, maximize their immune rejuvenation. So it starts with some fairly simple things. The, the, the simple things are the things we've been going through. Maybe they're simple to say, but not so easy to do. That's changing some lifestyle principles. So you start um, looking at things like your sleep. You start looking at your activity level. You start looking at how much are you eating uh, out of rushed habit patterns of things you know better than to eat, but mm. it's just convenient to eat them. And one of the things that has been very useful for me, and I, I found when I did a, a, a series of little Instagram posts on this, are these biometric devices that we wear, these wearable devices that give us information. And I, and I, ha I happen to be uh, wearing an aura ring because after you know, being a biohacker and wearing all, all sorts of different equip pieces of equipment, this one I found gives me the, the most interesting information. Mm -hmm. And what I found is um, from a personal experience, now I've done really a kind of a pilot study and I think it's more general, is that our aura ring is actually a surrogate marker to measure aspects of our immune system. Yeah. Because what happens is uh, when you're under immune stress, it's eating, do you realize over 50% of your metabolic energy can be eaten up by your immune system when you're under immune stress? So what happens is your body temperature goes up, your uh, heart rate variability goes down, your respiration goes up, your heart rate goes up, your uh, sleep patterns go down. So, you know, when you see these very low uh, scores in the morning from an aura ring that says, well, geez, what's going on? It's probably something that happened to you last night that affected yeah. your immune system. Could be alcohol, it yeah. could be it stayed up too late, it could be stress, but your immune system is fighting, is telling you that it's under, it's under demand. Mm -hmm. So these tools, to me, are useful for supporting your coaching system, right? Because you need to coach yourself through these behavior changes of improving your sleep, your activity, your diet, and, you know, things that you need to rhythmically figure out about your life that are directly being manifest through your immune mm. system into your function. Your immune system is directly connected 24-7 to everything you're doing. Yeah. So what are these four steps that you talk about? Well, I just told you the first step is assessment, right? Is understanding where you are. What's the yeah. base? Then from the first Your immunotype in a, that's in a right. way. It's your immunotype. And we have a, a questionnaire on the um, Bitwell Health uh, website that gives a, a kind of a first uh, kind of look-see. So we start off with the first thing, which really you, you, you very well stated, and that is finding those patterns of behavior that tie to your immunoty immunotype. Are you an allergic type? Are you an inflammatory type? Are you a, a type with, that tends to get everything that comes along so you have an immunosuppressed state? Mm -hmm. So you understand a little bit about what your own immunopersonality is, and we have a questionnaire on our website uh, this is called the Immuno um, uh, Identity Questionnaire that gives a, a little bit of a, a help for a person identifying their own specific immunotype. Then we go from there saying, well, now you have your immunotype. What are you going to do to move you from an imbalanced immune state to a balanced immune state? That's what we're all hoping for. Because what we want to do is we don't want to shut off our immune system or we don't want to hyper-function it. I mean, people always say, boost your immune system. But well, hold it just a minute. If you're already in an inflammatory state, do you really want to boost your inflammation? No, you want to rebalance your inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so if people say, I'm just going to take a bunch of immune system boosting nutrients. Well, no, no, no. That may not actually only exacerbate the problem, yeah. make it worse. So the second step then is you modulate your immune system based upon what you've learned about your first state. Are you immuno underactive, immuno overactive? Do you need to bring your immune system down? Do you need to bring your immune system up? And we have a series of ways that that can be employed with diet and lifestyle. I would, uh, again, go back to where you uh, took us earlier, and that is make sure when you introduce the program that you're using food as a friend and you're using rhythmic eating so that time becomes your friend, your circadian rhythms doesn't become your enemy. Don't overindulge. Don't too frequently snack. I mean, it used to be, oh, we want to take seven to eight meals a day. Those are the days of hypoglycemia. That was probably not a good idea no. with regard to what we've learned about circadian rhythms. Then the next level, the, the third step, is how can I optimize my immune system by utilizing some of these specific uh, nutrients that we've been describing, the, the Himalayan tartary buckwheat phytochemicals. Um, I would also put in, into this family, there are three families of nutrients that are very important. The phytochemicals we've been discussing a lot. Second are pre and probiotics because the gut plays such an important role in modulating your immune system. 70% of our immune system is clustered around our gut. 
the so-called gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So we want the friendly microbiome, so pre and probiotics would be step two. And then the third are omega-3 fatty acids. There are more and more papers coming out to show the important role that omega-3 fatty acids have in balancing the immune system. And I might add, it's not just omega-3s in and of themselves. It's also in concert with vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc, and what are called pro-resolving mediators. Pro-resolving mediators are part of the omega-3 family that mm. activate the immune uh, regulation process and the inflammation regulation process. And we find that some fish oils uh, and, and, and marine oils have much higher levels of these pro-resolving mm. mediators, these PRMs, than others. So we want a high PRM, omega-3 rich oil, we want pre and probiotics, and we want the proper phytochemicals. And I think the point you made- And you, and you, you now have created these, this fish oil, this Dutch Harbor fish oil, which yeah. comes from Alaska. Right? Yeah, Dutch Harbor Omega, DHO, and it has the highest level we know of PRMs of any natural oil. So this is some of the beneficial stuff that's in fish oil that reduces inflammation, but it, it, it's, it's a separate class of compounds than just the omega-3s. They're called right. pro-resolving mediators. Basically, your, your immune system has a way, a break, a way of resolving the inflammation. That's and these right. are called pro-resolvents, and they, they come from these certain uh, sources of omega-3s, and you, you've got those uh, access from Alaska, and now you have a product that's called Dutch Harbor Omega-3 oil, which you can get on bigboldhealth.com, right? Yeah, exactly, and I might say that the reason that we haven't heard more about these pro-resolving mediators in, in these commercial oil sub omega-3 supplements is that when most omega-3 oils are manufactured, they're cleaned up through a very complex process that strips out the PRMs, it removes them. So people don't talk about them because they're not in they're the not products. There. Yeah. And so you have to have a very mild process to retain these uh, ingredients within fish oils, which we've been able to develop. So aside from all the lifestyle factors, let's just sort of summarize, okay. you know, that help us to remove the things that are causing damage to our immune system and immunosenescence and age, in addition to sort of enhancing our immune system with you know, right sleep and exercise and timing of eating and whole foods diets, there's some super hacks, right? Things like phytochemicals from Himalayan tarry buckwheat, pre and probiotics to help our microbiome regulate itself, and these pro-resolving mediators that come from special kinds of fish oil. Yes. That's powerful. Well, let, let, thank you. Now, let me just say one thing about uh, what we've learned, because a lot of this people would say, it sounds interesting, but where's the proof? And fortunately, now uh, the phytochemical portfolio in Himalayan tartary buckwheat has been studied clinically now in, in studies with humans for a number of years. So we have an idea how much you need to get in order to produce this. And it's equivalent to something like 100 grams a day. Uh, that would be something like three and a half ounces of Himalayan tartary buckwheat flour delivers the level of these phytochemicals that have been found to be associated with improved immune function. So people would say, well, I really don't eat Himalayan tartary buckwheat flour every day. Well, we've tried to produce other ways of getting it, like through a shake mix or through a capsule that's concentrated in these phytochemicals, knowing that not everybody's going to... So you're going to have like four capsules a day and get it's like a quarter of a pound of, that's right. of the flour, which is pretty amazing. And by the way, I've used this flour, made the best pancakes, chai, Himalayan buckwheat pancakes from my oh, no, buck no. pecan diet. We made, we made soba noodles. Uh, we made dumpling skins, like for, you know, dumplings, which are amazing. <laughs> and it tastes so good. It's so good. And it's, and what's fascinating about it is that not only are you developing a product or a series of products that, that take advantage of these phytochemicals, the phytonutrients to rejuvenate our immune system, but it's tied into the bigger ecosystem in which we live. That, that it's not only important of uh, what you grow, it's how you grow it. Yeah. So you could grow this in a way using chemicals and poor soils like that are eroded, that don't have organic matter, and you wouldn't necessarily get the same product. What you're finding is that using practices that we call regenerative agriculture, which we've talked a lot on this podcast, so it's a way of regenerating ecosystems, regenerating the soil, and building the organic matter in the soil, that, that you can not only help rejuvenate human health, but planetary health, yes. that we can address the ravages of using all the industrial agrochemicals, the fertilizers, the pesticides, the herbicides, the high amounts of irrigation that deplete our water resources and the depletion of the soil microbiome through these chemicals and tillage and all these practices that have been so destructive and 
may account uh, for a significant part of climate change and that the soil itself is a sink for carbon and can draw down carbon through the power of these plants that suck carbon out of the atmosphere because they breathe carbon dioxide. But you can't do it if you don't use regenerative agriculture. And the beautiful thing about the Himalayan tartary buckwheat is that not only are you growing it to produce these phytochemicals for human health, but the very way you're growing it is also helping planetary health using regenerative agriculture. And there's very few regenerative products out there on the market now, and, and this is one of them. Uh, and it's, it's amazing, and it's gluten-free, it's organic, it's non-GMO. And what's really fascinating about this packaging, Jeff, is, and you can buy this now on bigboldhealth.com, right? Is not only do you, you talk about the nutrient contents, way higher in protein than most other grains, way lower in its impact on blood sugar, so very low glycemic index much higher levels of magnesium and zinc and iron and all kinds of nutrients. But what's amazing is that on the, and I've never seen this, is it says total polyphenols, which are the antioxidant levels. These are the phytonutrients, which is amazing that we now, you know, have, it's almost like a, uh, like a medicine. It's almost like a, you're seeing like a, a, a flower package that has a drug on it, which is like so cool, <laughs> except these drugs are phytochemicals. Well, we're, we're the, I think, the first group uh, in the flower area to actually be certifying on each batch our phytochemical levels mm. uh, that are these immune active uh, phytonutrients. It's so important. And I think, you know, as you've taught us all, Jeff, food is medicine. But then that begets the question of, well, what foods contain the most medicine and how do you grow foods yeah. to contain the most medicine? And it turns out that regenerative agriculture is that method. That we've seen a 50% drop in lots of minerals and other nutrients in vegetable crops over the last 50 years. So even if you're eating your broccoli, it's not as good as it used to be. And using regenerative methods, we finally can actually bring back some of the, oh. this. And I think, you know, exploring the role of, and, and this flour is so great because flour, I mean, you can take the capsules, you can take a shake and all that's great. And that, that's kind of an easy way to do it. But, you know, people are, are you know, wanting to be gluten-free. They're wanting to yeah. eat low starch products. They're wanting to, you know, eat fun stuff too. They don't want to give up noodles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want to give up pancakes. Yeah. And you don't have to, which is the beautiful thing about this. And I, I can't tell you how excited I am. And full disclosure, everybody, I'm an investor in Big Bold Health. I'm helping Jeff with this project. I believe it brings together the things that we both have been passionate about for the last you know, 50 years for you, 30 years for me, which is food is medicine and, and regenerative agriculture and restoring ecosystems. And it's just, it's such a beautiful idea for this moment in time. And I'm, I'm so excited to see how we're gonna build this and grow this. So everybody should check it out. Go to bigboldhealth.com, learn about Himalayan tartary buckwheat. You can get the products, you can get the flour, and you can make the pancakes from my book, Peak and Die, they're really good. <laughs> and you can also get the HDB Rejuvenate, which is the supplement yeah. uh, or the shake. So I encourage people to check it out. Uh, there's also the Dutch Harbor Omega there, which is great. And I, I think, you know, Jeff is someone who doesn't need to do one more thing in his life to have a successful career in life. And the fact that Jeff has gone back at 75 years old to do this because uh, it is, key solution to our chronic disease pandemic and our immune dysfunction and aging. And I, I'm just so excited about it. I can't even tell you, Jeff. So I'd like to just say one last thing that I've learned, uh, which I think kind of is a, a metaphor to everything we talked about. And it's actually been captured in our little graphic that we have on the front of the Himalayan tartary buckwheat flower, that, uh, which is a, a kind of a flowering Himalayan tartary buckwheat plant. So when I was at the farm for our first harvest with uh, our farmer, Sam Beer, who is a former Cornell University ag professor, researcher, mm. um, and we were walking in the field uh, and the, the flowers were in bloom. Uh, it was, it was pre-harvest. And, and as I looked in the field, I saw all these bees. Bees? Bees. They love Himalayan tartary buckwheat Wow. Flowers. And I was then thinking about the interconnection that here we have bees who are then having their community taking this information back to their hives, right? Yeah. From the pollen, which is rich in all these phytochemicals. Yeah. To bolster the immune defense of the bees. Wow. To be part of this system that we're then creating a, an ultimate seed that's going to go out to humans to improve their immune system. Yeah. And it just, it just really hit me very hard. That's that incredible. When you start doing systems thinking, as we started this discussion with functional right. medicine, I mean, it right. goes to everything. Right? I mean, but that's what regenerative agriculture is. Ecosystem agriculture 
And functional medicine is ecosystem medicine. Yes. It's really that was what it is. Exactly. So we're being ecological doctors, both for human and planetary health. It's beautiful. Thank you. Well, what, Jeff, what, what fun this has been. Well, thank you, Jeff. This is, I mean, I, I want to recap, but I think it would take an hour to recap. <laughs> but basically, the good news is, you know, even though our immune systems age, we can reverse that aging and we can do it through a comprehensive lifestyle issues, but also using the power of these phytochemicals and particularly this amazing new superfood, Himalayan tartaric buckwheat. Jeff, thank you for what you do for all of us uh, and for what you do to make the world a better place. Um, if you've been listening to this podcast and you loved it, please share with your friends and family on social media, subscribe wherever you get your podcast, leave a comment. How's your immune system doing? <laughs> yeah. And what can you do to make it better? Uh, and we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you so, so much for enjoying this. Hey YouTube, if you like this video, you're gonna love the next one. Click on it to check it out today. If you are suffering, there is a road for most people to recover. And mm -hmm. functional medicine <clears throat> is the GPS system to figure out how to navigate that road. Yes. And, and it really is a powerful model. It's not the answer to everything, but it is a far better mouse.